This is me in 2016. In fact, this is me living in Dubai doing a skydive over the Palm Jumeirah, which is actually where I lived back then. Now, Dubai was quite a glamour-filled place. It was all about parties, having fun, working hard, playing hard. And I'd moved out there with a dream job where I worked internationally, traveling the world to sports events. It was about the beach, the sun, and the high life. But underneath, I knew that I wasn't very happy. I felt like I didn't really belong. I felt like everything around me was a little bit meaningless. I felt unfulfilled. There was a part of me, a sort of void inside me, that felt like whatever I was doing at that moment, at that time, was not enough. There was always something out there I should be seeking. And it didn't matter what life had provided me, I always felt like there was more. There was always something more to aim for. Now, if you'd met me back then, I don't think you would have known. I put on a persona of being fun, outgoing, confident. But when I got back home, the people who knew me closest could see that I was withdrawn, I felt lonely, and I'd have bouts of depression. Now, this feeling wasn't new. I'd moved jobs, I'd moved countries, I'd moved relationships to try and escape that feeling. And I was tired at this point. I was tired of avoiding it. So one day, I decided I had to leave. I left my job. I left my flat. I left my girlfriend. I told her that I just couldn't do it and I didn't know why, but I had to go. And I got in a taxi with a one-way ticket back to the UK. I knew I was tired of it. I knew I was frustrated. But honestly, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. I got back to the UK on the 5th of November 2016, and it was bonfire night. I went from the sun to, in Dubai to a freezing cold, dark November in the UK. And I stayed with my sister's family that night, and I slept on their sofa. And as I watched the fireworks with her family, I made a pledge to myself that I was going to go and find out what was going on for me, whatever it took. And so, here's what I did. Nothing. Well, I went to the pub. I filled up my diary. I kept busy. I went back to work. I did all the normal things that I used to do. I continued to avoid it. I continued to numb the unhappy feeling. To be honest, I was too scared to look into it. I thought it might open a can of worms that I didn't want to go to. About a year after I returned from Dubai, a friend said to me that she, in a really vulnerable conversation, she said to me that she was seeing, seeing a therapist. Now, <laughs> I'd never seen a counselor, a therapist, any kind of professional speaking service in that way. I didn't really know what it involved. I didn't know how, to, how you even got involved and spoke to those kind of people. I was quite skeptical about the whole thing, if I'm honest. But I knew that I still had that feeling and I really wanted to do something about it. So I plucked up the courage to get that therapist number and to go and see her. And now I'd never spoken to anyone about my feelings before, certainly not my darkest thoughts. And at the end of the first session, I remember this, she clasped her hands together like this and said, 
you're in the right place. Is that right? The more I talked with her, the more that I revealed just how negative my inner world was. How, without me really realizing it, I had an inner critic inside that would abuse me daily. And when it's inside your head, it's not something you can get away from. And I came to understand that that inner critic was based on something called shame. Now, I sort of heard of shame before, thought I kind of understood it, but let's just take a moment to define it. It's probably best described in comparison to guilt, they're quite similar feelings. Guilt is, I've done something wrong, I feel remorse. That didn't fit with my values, my principles. Shame is, I am wrong. There is something defective about me. There is something wrong with me. And it was that belief that was underneath, driving that inner critical voice that I had every single day. Now, it was the first step just to acknowledge that that was the case. But the next step now is to understand it more deeply. And I was encouraged to face that inner critic that I had avoided and numbed from my whole life. And I can tell you, it was the last thing that I wanted to do. <sighs> but with much pain, I turned and I said, what do you want to tell me? And I wrote all the messages that came up. This is the actual document that I wrote back then. That's four pages of A4. Every single line is a new piece of abuse that my inner critic said to me. It said I was not clever, not interesting, not fun enough, not good looking enough. It said I'm lazy, weak, childish, pointless, of no value. And this was the tape running around my head all day, every day, belittling me. As I revealed more and talked more, I realized that these constant negative beliefs, these inner criticisms, were like a snowball that just got heavier and heavier and heavier over my life. And what I came to understand is just the web of influence that had had on all areas of my life. Because when my internal world was so negative and so unhappy, that means I didn't want to connect with myself. I didn't want to go there, which meant that I then couldn't connect with my feelings, which meant that I couldn't, I didn't know what my interests were, what brought me passion and joy. That self-critic had meant that I couldn't make mistakes because if I made a single mistake, my inner critic would abuse me for it. I was risk averse. And that prevented growth because there is no growth without trying things, risking things and making mistakes. And no vulnerability meant no creativity and spontaneity. And the more disconnected with myself I became, that was the void. That was the thing that was hurting me so much my whole life. But the thing that cost me the most the greatest amount was that my utter fear of being seen because of these shameful beliefs, of letting people see the true me, had let go of the things that make life meaningful. It meant I couldn't access the human needs of genuine growth and progress and connection and love. Because vulnerability is at the heart of what make li makes life meaningful. You may or may not know this man, 
This is Carl Jung. He's a Swiss psychiatrist, or was a Swiss psychiatrist, and known as one of the grandfathers of, of human psychology. Carl Jung believed that we all have unconscious shadows. These are the negative beliefs that we hold about ourselves, that we hide and we repress and we deny. From other people, for sure, but also a lot of the time from ourselves. And if kept secret, they control our lives without potentially us even knowing. They influence our thoughts and our feelings and our behavior. And we all have them. But rather than keeping them hidden, if we acknowledge them, if we bring them to the fore, we can integrate them into our lives and they don't have to hold us back. We do not have to be slaves to our shadows. So I've got a question for you all here. Just consider inside, do you have any negative beliefs about yourself? Any inner criticisms that go around your head? Things that maybe you're ashamed of about your life, about your background, about who you are, about what you can do? Do these hold you back? I also came to understand that it was not enough just to reveal these shames, these shadows to myself and just understand them for myself. The next step was going to have to be that I was going to have to be vulnerable with these things in wider groups with other people if I was going to get any healing. So I was encouraged to go to groups like these where people sit and talk about their feelings. Now, obviously, I was absolutely terrified of that whole concept. That sounded so squeamish to me. But I went. I'd go, I'd sit in the back, I wouldn't say anything, and I'd leave as soon as the meeting was over. But I kept going back. And I kept going back. And I kept going back. And what I saw when I went to these, these groups, full of all sorts of different people, different eth ethnicities, backgrounds, social classes, sexualities, is that we all, every single one of us, has shames, negative beliefs about ourselves, shadows. Just consider the, the research on imposter syndrome. Depending on which research you read, between 70 and 90% of us will suffer from imposter syndrome during our lives. Just consider how that shows just how far the concept of not good enough goes. And also, how much of it, if that's the truth, and we hardly ever hear about it, how much of it is kept secret. I also came to see in these groups that shame can impact us in relatively small ways and just holding us back, the, that, that inner critic saying, no, you can't do that. But it can also, unchecked, lead to pretty severe mental health issues. I saw how it could lead to addiction, Anxiety, depression, eating disorders, and suicide. I also attended quite a lot of men-only groups as well. And there again, I saw how that feeling of not good enough, needing to prove, could lead to men chasing power wealth and prestige over the things that really matter in life. And how unchecked that feeling could come out sideways into anger and violence.
as I kept going back to these groups, I came to realize there was something magical going on. These people were having conversations that I never saw on the street, or at work, or with my friends down the pub. They were having fully connected conversations based on the, ba based on the fact that there were no holes barred. They were telling each other everything. They were being entirely vulnerable. And the connection in these groups was something I'd never seen before. As I got more confident, I managed to be able to share about my stuff, my shame. I started to rewire my old attitude to vulnerability. I came to realize that it was strength, not weakness. It was the thing I'd been looking for. But shame absolutely hates the light. It hates being seen by other people. As I shared, it started to lose its power and it started to diminish. Vulnerability was the route to freedom. Now, I'm on a journey and I don't believe that there is an end point. I don't believe there is a destination. But by continuing to turn up, and be vulnerable and take risks. At this point, I'm more in touch with my interests, my true passions. I've pursued more of my goals, new career options. I take more risks, like doing something as scary as this. I'm making my life bigger and more expansive every day, caring less what other people think. I have more joy, connection, and intimacy than ever before. Vulnerability was new to me, but it was the key. Now, I've now attended hundreds of these support groups, lots of men's groups. I mentor people in their mental health. And if I could leave you with one message, it would be this. We all have shadows that we hide and we repress and we deny. But where your pain is, is where you will find your answers. If we have the courage to take responsibility for these things and face our fears, if we have the courage to open up in front of other people, we can break the shackles of these things and find freedom. I can tell you that it will be amazing for the good of yourself, but I believe also for the good of society. Now, I'm on a journey, as I say. It isn't over. But a big part of me reducing my shadow was coming here today to share. So thank you.